I that's all I have. Uh, thank you for coming, like I said, and happy Thanksgiving for those who celebrate. And I'm going to turn it over to Donna, who is the Historical Society's head of the speaker series. <laughs> I'm whatever. First of all, welcome. Thank you for taking uh, this afternoon to come and join us. Um, as Chris said, um, this whole series this year has been celebrating the 150th anniversary of the Platinum of Oakwood. So when you come to these speaker presentations, whether you've known it or not, you're hearing something about what made Oakwood a community from the very beginning through businesses like last week with Dorothy Lane Market and the innovation that's so widespread throughout all of the history and founding of, of Oakwood. Um, so as we conclude this speaker series, what I wanted to do is something a little different. We're breaking the mold. We're not going to talk about history. We're gonna talk about the future and what we would like to leave as a legacy. So in a hundred years, when they're all sitting in this building having the Farmhill Speaker Series, they can go back and say, you know, back then in, 19, in 2022, they came up with some really terrific ideas that have cemented and kept Oakwood a viable presence within the, the region, the state, and the country. So today I am very happy to welcome Oakwood's Vice Mayor, Steve Bonington. Um, Steve received a degree in architecture, and actually that's where my husband and I first met him, was through the Leadership Dayton Program as he was progressing through that. Um, he now has gone from working at a private architecture firm to being the, are you the, titled the architect at Wright Patterson? No, I'm the cultural resources. Okay, yeah. cultural resources. Yeah, I'm trying to make him bigger than more important than he is, but he already is important. So, um, and Steve oversees all of the wonderful historical aspects of Wright Patterson. Um, the, the beautiful quarters, the ponds, the Huffman Prairie, you name it. But he's not going to talk about that today to us. We're going to talk about with the strategic plan and some of the things that we can start feeding ideas to the city for um, and how we want to do our future. So with that, welcome, Steve. We're glad you're here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, I guess we've got two hands here. Um, I appreciate the uh, everybody coming out today. Uh, this is a lot of fun for me as uh, Donna mentioned, I'm more of a historian. Uh, so being a futurist is not necessarily in my wheelhouse, but we're gonna give it a, a go here. Uh, the way I wanna start off though, is just tell you a little bit about myself, not because I think any of you are interested, but mainly to, um, to let you know a little bit about why some of the decisions and some of the things that uh, I think are gonna happen to Oakwood uh, are going to happen. It just gives you a little context of my uh, way of thinking. First of all, I grew up as an army brat. I traveled from city to city until I went to college, never stayed in the same city for more than three years. Uh, so growing up, I was exposed to a lot of different areas, a lot of different communities, sizes, those type of things. Um, so that uh, has a little bit to do with why I really love Oakwood. Um, I, as was mentioned, I have a bachelor's of architecture degree uh, from Texas Tech University. I have a specialization in architectural history and preservation. Uh, most of my career, though, has been spent doing commercial architecture, uh, but I've always had that love. And anytime we had specific projects that dealt with history, I was the guy that uh, they chose to do that. Uh, moved into Oakwood in 1999, uh, shortly after I graduated from, from uh, school. Um, uh, I came out this direction for the same reason that most men do anything following a girl. Uh, so uh, so I, I moved to this region without knowing anything about the area, uh, but absolutely fell in love with uh, when I got here. Uh, and as I mentioned, was uh, moved in in, uh, in 1999. Uh, one of the things that I absolutely, that uh, made me choose Oakwood is because as an architect, the architectural style, the character of all of our neighborhoods uh, just really drew me to that. And I couldn't find any place that was like that uh, and uh, was the reason I moved here. Uh, once I got into Oakwood, I felt like I needed to get involved uh, to share a little bit of my experience with folks. Uh, so I was appointed to the Oakwood Planning Commission in 2005. Uh, that same year, I was also appointed to the Wright Memorial Library Board. So this place is near and dear to me. When I was here, this room wasn't <laughs> here. Um, but um, uh, then in uh, 2007, I was uh, selected for or uh, 
uh, elected to Oakwood City Council. I'm also a member of the Oakwood Rotary and the Historical Society. And as, as was mentioned, I'm the Cultural Resources Manager for Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Basically what that means is all the different cultural uh, buildings, uh, areas, you know, Huffman Prairie, those type of things. I sort of oversee anything that goes on with that in terms of maintenance, uh, new projects that are being built on the base to make sure that they're in compliance with historic preservation um, uh, guidelines. Start off, as was mentioned, I'm the vice mayor. I just wanted to sort of introduce you in case you're not familiar with uh, all the members of city council. We have our mayor, William Duncan, uh, myself, council member Rob Stevens, Ann Hilton, and Lee Turbin, who's in the back there, I, I saw. Um, we also have our city manager here, Mark Klosh. Uh, so if uh, I don't get anything right, you can ask him. He's, uh, he's really in charge of everything. Uh, well, just be advised, there's also some of them that are online. Oh, are they? Okay. So, I'm guessing that's Ann Hilton. Uh, and also Mayor Duncan. Oh, okay. Wow, he figured out how to use the computer. <laughs> that's fantastic. I can't. That is fantastic. Um, but I just wanted to, to show this uh, slide because it, it kind of shows all the different areas of expertise that uh, our council has. Each one of us is sort of uh, selected for a specific committee uh, to, to sort of head up. So mine are finance. Uh, planning and zoning, and then I also am a member of the Miami, Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission um, and the First Suburbs Consortium, uh, as well as I'm the liaison member of council to the Planning Commission. I started in 2005, I'm still on the <coughs> Planning Commission, so that's one of the reasons I have such a love for how Oakwood develops. Uh, okay, so we're going to start off and Dono is not exactly accurate because I am going to talk a little bit about the past <laughs> as well as the present because really you can't get to you can't get to the future without those. So uh, some important dates I just want to go over here uh, in uh, the history of Oakwood. 1872, as was mentioned, was the uh, 150 years ago. That was the first platting uh, in what they called at that time it was the settlement of Oakwood. Uh, the four guys. Anybody know the four guys? <laughs> well, I know, you know, Haas, Dixon, Mitchell, and Harmon. Uh, so at that time, they uh, they planted 94 uh, uh, lots that they thought that they were going to sell to folks. Unfortunately, that didn't really work out, and not all 94 were sold right off the bat. Um, 1908 is when uh, that settlement turned into a village, became the village of Oakwood in 1908. Uh, around that time, folks were starting to take notice of Oakwood. Um, from the city of Dayton, and we're starting to move out in this area. But it still wasn't as popular as you would have thought. Uh, most of the lots were larger estates. Uh, there were folks who were building their summer homes out here. Most of that had to do with the fact that there wasn't a lot of uh, uh, transportation up here. The railways weren't all that uh, reliable, uh, but that started to change. 1913, we all know, is the Oakwood flood. Um, what that did was told a lot of people who were living in the lower areas that, hey, maybe we need to live in the higher areas. <laughs> so Oakwood became very, very popular after that time period. Um, uh, then we get up to 1931 when the uh, village of Oakwood turns into the city of Oakwood. Um, we get to 1952 when we have the first zoning code uh, was implemented in, in Oakwood. Between 30, 31 and 52, Oakwood was um, uh, didn't have the same borders that we have currently. Uh, so between that, that time period, uh, uh, 30s to 40s, the people were annexing land for various different areas. Uh, it wasn't until about 1950, I think it was, where you know, Kettering was established, the city of Dayton was established, and Oakwood sort of developed its, the, the last of its hard line uh, perimeters. So in 50s, we have our first zoning code, which starts telling us what we can do with that, that particular, uh, with the land that we do have. Uh, we jump up to 1989, where we have our first comprehensive plan put into place. That comprehensive plan sort of really focused more on uh, the business district and really establishing some of the standards for how our business district was being developed. But there were also things that had to do with uh, uh, residential and sort of what we were thinking about Oakwood becoming in the future. Uh, 2000 is when uh, the current zoning code that we, we still uh, use today was applied. 
uh, 2004 is when the comprehensive plan, the one that we use today, uh, was developed. And I'm going to go into a lot more detail on that. So, uh, and then the last is the current date, 2022. Uh, Oakwood City Council just um, uh, passed a resolution accepting the current uh, comprehensive plan as the, the plan that will move us forward. Uh, we found that the one that was put together in 24 was so quote unquote comprehensive that really there weren't a lot of changes that were needed for that uh, to be developed. So it was, we're continuing to use that. So uh, Abraham Lincoln said the best way to predict the future is to create. And I think that's something that Oakwood has taken to heart a long time ago. Uh, and we still use that sentiment uh, is that as part of our comprehensive plan, we've looked at what are the things that we as a community feel are important? What are the things that we want to see our community turn into? And uh, by seeing those things, writing those things down, putting them into a comprehensive plan, we are able to then create our own future from that. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of what I'm going to talk about that it comes from the Oakwood's comprehensive plan. This is a plan that is on our website. Uh, I encourage you to go out there and check it out at uh, uh, oakwoodohio.gov. Um, I think this is our actually our homepage, or at least no, it, I think you have to click on one button to get to this. But the Oakwood comprehensive plan is there. It's a very lengthy document. I will show you. Uh, when I first got onto council in 2007, this is one of the first documents I read cover to cover, uh, was the comprehensive plan, making sure that I understood how, um, how the folks that came before me saw the future of Oakwood and what kind of things I need to use as, as my guidelines for the decision making that I have. So it's a fairly decent sized book. Uh, it's very, very comprehensive. That's a word I'm going to use a lot because Boy, they spent a lot of time, a lot of effort talking with the various different folks to put this thing together. But if you're interested in reading through it, it's a it's a great read. Um, there is a lot of information in there, and um, I'll just go over some of the things that are in there. You know, basically what it is is it's a it's our official policy guide. Uh, it's how we determine how certain physical improvements are going to be uh, developed. Um, it considers our immediate needs as well as those for the future. So when it was put together, we sort of knew that it was a snapshot at one time, but we were looking at some of the issues that were, we thought were gonna be important uh, and um, felt that it needed to be put in this particular format. Uh, what it does is it focuses on the, the needs of our community. I, I was, this always, cracks me up when they call us a mature community because I, I don't necessarily consider myself all that mature, but I think they have, it, it has more to do with the, uh, uh, the character of, of our buildings and, and uh, those type of things. So uh, we strive to maintain and enhance traditional forms and character of the features in Oakwood. Um, and it just allows us to, uh, to promote high quality improvements. So when people, either Oakwood residents uh, are looking to do something with their property or we have developers come in, it sort of gives us a guideline to look at as we uh, evaluate those uh, programs. And what it covers is a lot. You know, it, it's uh, uh, land use, it's uh, traffic patterns, protection of the character. We've got parks, schools, all these things I'm gonna get into in a little bit more detail here. Uh, but as I mentioned, it's an effective tool for us. Um, it was put together through a process that included a planning commission uh, or a planning committee. That committee, if I recall correctly, had like 25 citizen members. Uh, each one of those 25 members was encouraged to get at least 10 uh, of their uh, fellow uh, neighbors to participate as well. So it was sort of this Let's try to get 250 people involved the best way we can and, and uh, started off with the 25. Uh, there were several community outreach work workshops that took place. Uh, there was a written community survey. We did a telephone survey. Uh, there were a lot of uh, personal interviews with uh, folks from the city. I think some of them actually might in, be in the room today. Um, we had a community open house as well as a lot of uh, neighborhood meetings in uh, the actual uh, neighborhoods uh, and people's homes. Um, the city sees that comprehensive plan here as a, as a vibrant but flexible document. We don't see it as something that's just hard line and, you know, th 
this is the way it is. We see that you know attitudes are going to change, new issues are going to arise, and we want to make sure that that comprehensive plan gives us the flexibility to to review those things and add new uh, components to it. So, um, as I mentioned, it, it's a detailed planning guide. Um, We'll go over some of the goals and objectives. It's divided into eight categories, and I'll apologize to Norb back there because he's he's done this presentation. <laughs> in fact, uh, uh, so it's actually it's kind of nice payback because he tends to <laughs> he tends to do a lot of presentations I've heard as well. Um, but the the first item is community image and character. We have housing and residential areas, uh, commercial and business development transportation, community facilities, parks, and well, I don't have to read them all to you. Uh, and besides, I'm gonna go over them. Um, first of them is the community image and character. And this one I think is probably the most important, um, at least personally to me, is that you know we want to make sure that in the future, or currently and in the future, that our community has sort of the, the image and the character that we feel as a community it should. Uh, our goal here was to continue to have an attractive and distinctive community image. Uh, I included the slide of the library because, I mean, if you, you think of some of the iconic views of what Oakwood is, this is one of those iconic views. Um, so we want our comprehensive plan to uh, allow us to, to uh, accentuate those community image uh, issues the characters and qualities that we have and then distinguish us from from other communities. We got our housing and residential areas, you know, where we have a goal of making sure that our housing inventory um, is up to snuff that we provide all the different services that folks uh, believe should be part of our, our image. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about this a little later when I talk about the future. But, you know, when you, you talk about Oakwood currently, this is sort of kind of the ideal the picture you have of a lot of the buildings. I think that in the future, this is going to be something that will be modified, uh, but it's something that we understand as um, you know, the traditional image and character for our city. We've got the commercial and business development area. You know, uh, we've got several different business districts. We have the one, the main business district as well as the one across from um, City Hall, uh, and then further down by UD. But, you know, this is an important component of our comprehensive plan is that when businesses come to our community, that we make sure that they're, they're uh, businesses that have the right uh, mindset as to what they're trying to achieve in our community. Uh, you know, you'll notice we haven't done a lot of, you know, fast food restaurants or those type of things because they we're really looking at making sure that the businesses that are within our, our footprint, you know, are goods and services that we feel our, our residents are uh, feel are important to them. Transportation is always a big one. You know, uh, it's one of the ones that we sort of, I think, take for granted in a lot of cases, but we want to make sure that we have a, you know, a transportation system within our city that um, provides for vehicles, pedestrians, uh, you know, with, with our school system and the way the kids have to, to get to school each day, we have a lot of pedestrians walking our community. One of the things that that uh, drew me to this community was the fact that you know you can walk up and down your street and neighbors are sitting on their front porch and you say hi and you know that there are still cars but boy a lot of people walk you know people with strollers you know and that sense of community was important to me um, I wanted you know my wife to be able to walk up to Dorothy Lane Market and not have to worry about her crossing major traffic uh, uh, roads and those type of things. Um, making sure that kids can go up and down uh, streets without having to worry about things. So transportation is one of those things we take for granted sometimes, but it, as from the city standpoint, we really are thinking about it. Community facilities, you know, we want to make sure that we're always providing the best services we can to the, the residents of the city of Oakwood. Um, one of our old city managers, Dave Fell, used to talk about taxes and, you know, everybody would say, you know, open taxes are extremely high, and he, I can't remember the exact quote, Norb can probably correct me if I'm wrong, but he said it's not, you know, how much money you pay, but how much value you get for the money that you are paying, that you have that feeling that 
I'm paying this money, but I, as part of my community, I know that those services are coming back to me and I'm getting value. That's something that I think every single member of council really takes to heart. We want to make sure that you know we're good stewards of the money that the, the city is, is paying. And we make sure that we provide all the different uh, services, whether that you know is our city services, uh, public safety services, parks, recreation, all of those different things. Uh, that which leads into our next one, which is just parks and open spaces. Um, because the city of Oakwood is a, you know, we are a, a small community, just a little under three square miles. Um, you know, we do not have a lot of uh, open space, but the open space that we have, we really spend time trying to accentuate, make sure that as many people can use it as possible uh, and that it's used effectively. Uh, I, I think we have some of the best uh, parks and open spaces in the community or in the area, I should say. One of the other components of the comprehensive plan was just marketing and promotion of the city of Oakwood. You know, we wanted folks to be able to understand what made us special. Uh, one of the things that, you know, we wanted a coordinated approach to marketing uh, where folks would understand what the high quality uh, services that we provided. Um, and one of the things that we always, we tout is our public safety department. Uh, it's one of uh, only two or three in the nation that is a full service. You know, every officer is is uh, triple trained in fire, police, and medical services. They're either EMTs or paramedics. Uh, that's a very unique system, and it's something that works extremely well for us. Uh, and we try to to highlight that when we're promoting the the uh, the community. And the last is uh, communication cooperation. You know. We don't see ourselves as an island within the community. Uh, you know, we want a communication approach where the city is actively out there, uh, engaged with other communities around us, trying to figure out where um, what projects are taking place in various different areas. This is a picture of the Regional Planning Commission meeting. Um, this is a large group. This is folks from uh, nine county area, uh, from every different communities. It's it's a uh, a council of governments. Uh, so we have a representative on dead center in the middle right there. You can tell by the wall dead. Um, but uh, this is a fantastic group where we not only share the things that we're doing in the city of Oakwood, but we hear about all the different projects that are taking place in the, in the other communities and figuring out how we can either um, build upon those, um, how we need to react to them in some cases. Uh, but it's just a great transfer of information. And that's one of the things that the city is really always uh, interested in doing is staying involved with other public agencies, understanding what they're doing, uh, particularly when it comes to regional planning, because, you know, sometimes it, you can get into a situation where, you know, you've got a specific vision, but if everybody else around you has another vision and they're moving in a totally different direction, uh, you have to be prepared for those type of things. So, uh, Communication and cooperation is very important in the comprehensive plan. But the reason you guys came here was the future. <laughs> so futurists are people who uh, their specialty is, is futurology, which I did not know was a thing, but apparently it is. Um, it, it's the, the attempt to explore predictions for the future. Uh, I didn't really know that this was a specific thing until probably about five or six years ago, I read a a book called X Events. Um, it was basically a book about catastrophic events that can take place in the United States that could change everything. Uh, the funny thing is the book was written 10 years ago. Chapter one, I think, is pandemic. Um, and, you know, and so now I'm kind of looking through it going, OK, well, what's chapter two? <laughs> <laughs> so chapter two, uh, I think, has to do with like food securities. Uh, and yeah, so that was a, a book that was very influential in my way of thinking because uh, it, it made me realize that, you know, as good as we have things in a certain area, we always have to be cognizant of what's taking place in, in our entire community in our entire nation and our entire world. Because if you're not paying attention, those things will come and bite you. Uh, and I think we saw that here uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, so let's look into the crystal ball. Um, but before we look into the crystal ball, I have to do the disclaimers. Um, so the first disclaimer I'm gonna put is that these are my uh, opinions. Um, 
These are not staff opinions. These are not Oakwood City Council's opinions. Um, I say that because <laughs> as a member of City Council, we take it, um, uh, it very seriously that all the things that we discuss uh, about our city take place in public meetings. Uh, a lot of communities don't do that. Um, you know, a lot of times there's little secret meetings and those type of things. We, we are very much an open, transparent organization. Um, so if I throw out an idea or a thought or whatever, that's my own until it actually goes to a city council meeting and we <laughs> develop a policy or we have a discussion that would be open to somebody. So I always stress that. Um, I also stress there are no absolutes in planning. So when I say something here and I sound very uh, definitive about it and very sure about it, uh, boy, there are no absolutes. I've, I've come to find that out in the amount of time that I've been serving on city council. Sometimes you can be dead certain something is going to turn a certain way and boy, it doesn't happen that way. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. These are more conceptual um, concepts here. I will say any jabs that I take at other organizations, because as anybody who knows me, I tend to be a little bit sarcastic and I will take pot shots every once in a while. Um, they're not meant to be personal. They are certainly not personal. They are constructive criticism. Uh, I am fully aware, particularly as somebody who's done this job for a long period of time, that decisions that are made at any level are uh, difficult and they are also, um, you have to know all the backstory. So a lot of times, unfortunately, in our media now, we, we see something, we see somebody make a decision and we attack them not knowing anything about how they made the decision. You know, there are a lot of things going uh, in the uh, in the background. So I don't attack anybody lightly. I'm just I'm just trying to, you know, offer up some constructive criticism if I if I do that. And the last one, any rebroadcast. I love the major league uh, baseball thing. Um, I've always wanted to use that in the presentation. So, <laughs> um, OK, so in terms of the the future of Oakwood, one of the things that I think we're going to spend most of our time on in the future uh, is infrastructure. I know it's not the sexiest thing in the world. It's probably not the thing most people want to think about right off the bat when you think about the future of your community. But it is the one thing that really makes our life great. You know, it generally tends to be the thing that we all take for granted. Um, this is a, a shot of, of the, uh, uh, the folks doing the gas work throughout our city. I think you've all been exposed to that because we've, it's been a 13 year project. We're just about on the last year of it, um, but we're going back to replacing all the gas um, mains and distribution systems uh, because most of them were put in originally when the, the, the city was developed in 1908. Uh, and a lot of these are starting to fail and we're looking at something that needs to be done for this community that will take us into the, the next century. So it's not glorious work. It's not something, you know, and a lot of times, you know, we curse these people because they make us late to our, our, uh, our meetings or whatever, because they're blocking off the uh, far hills or whatever it might be. But this is something that the city takes very seriously in terms of infrastructure. Uh, we've got gas lines that, as I mentioned, we're, we're finishing off. We're constantly looking at our water lines, which are also, uh, you know, coming towards the end of their lifespan. Um, so we're, we're working on various different storm sewer <laughs> issues, those type of things. Um, we're cognizant of it. We, we just hired a new engineer for the city that is, is sort of uh, focused on a lot of these things, allowing us to look at some of the uh, things out in the future. Um, and we're very hopeful that we'll be able to, to, to uh, stay on top of infrastructure needs. Transportation is another large one that I think a lot of times we take for granted. Uh, we're just about to undertake a, a study uh, of our uh, 17, um, what do you call them? Uh, what's the term for uh, stoplight? Signalized intersection. Si signalized intersection, that's correct. Um, we've got uh, 17 signalized uh, intersections in the community of, of Oakwood. Uh, that system is starting to fail as well. And it's something we're looking at uh, for the future. How do we change those out? It's unbelievable the amount of money that is spent on these things. Uh, you know, if you had to guess how much a, a, a traffic signal costs, you would be wrong. And there would be a lot higher than whatever you thought it was. Um, but it's something that as a community, as I mentioned, you know, um, 
the safety of our citizens vehicularly as well as pedestrian wise. We want to make sure that that's uh, something that we're thinking about in the future. So we've got a, a company that's working with us to develop a master plan for that. And we will continue to look at uh, what are our options there. You might have read in the paper about a potential uh, roundabout uh, at the Five Points area. I am not going to mention anything about that <laughs> <laughs> because I want to be able to get out of this room. But um, I will say that that was an idea that was uh, broached by the actual uh, engineers that are uh, uh, doing the study for us. I will say that whatever your opinion is on roundabouts, they are here to stay. They are a transportation um, uh, issue that people are using throughout our community. If you looked at, say, 20 years ago, there might have been, say, uh, maybe a thousand in all of the United States. That number is now in the tens of thousands in terms of roundabouts in our communities uh, throughout the nation. So it's something we have to take into mind, but it will be something that, like, I talked about the comprehensive plan. Anything that we come up with in terms of an issue um, that is involved in our city, we'll come out to the community, we'll do presentations, we'll do informational set, uh, sessions, surveys, those type of things, and try to get feedback on anything that the uh, engineers might recommend. Housing. Housing is going to be another one. As I mentioned before, you know, we've got sort of the, the uh, uh, the thought that we all think of when you think of open housing, you've got the, the tutor type home, you've got the mission style, those type of things. Um, but one of the things that we found, you know, several years ago was that there were folks who were asking for different types of housing uh, in, in Oakwood. Uh, and there were developers who were willing to sort of uh, to look at those type of projects. So this is the uh, uh, element uh, at uh, Point Oakwood. Uh, this is a 84 unit uh, apartment building. Um, it's right there by the, uh, the fields, um, Old River Fields. Um, it does provide a different type of housing that wasn't available uh, previous. We've, had, we've always had apartments in uh, Oakwood. They generally tend to be small scale. Uh, this particular uh, apartment complex lended itself well for a large open site. Um, it was a very contentious issue uh, when it when it took place. And in fact, uh, at the time I had to recuse myself from this particular vote because I lived right across the street from the Point Oakwood area. But understanding, you know, what the, the needs of the community are is very important. You have to look at all the different things that are going to take place in the future in terms of housing needs. And this uh, uh, definitely fills one of those needs. As far as I understand, all these units are completely filled. So it's not like something that, you know, they, they built it and nobody came. No, they they built it and people were waiting to, to, to get in as soon as they got their uh, final occupancy permits. So um, one of the other things I think is going to happen with, with housing in the future, this is uh, a, a buddy of mine's house, uh, Mike Ridgely. Uh, this is at Little Woods over by the old, um, oh, I can't remember the, the mansion that's out there. Mead. The Mead Mansion, yes. Um, that that area was subdivided into smaller lots, uh, and I think that was something that you know Mike, who is an architect as well with Richley Architects, um, he could have come in and put in something that was exactly like everything else that had been built in Oakwood, but he chose to build something that was perfect for his family. Uh, he believes in uh, uh, lead design green design. So his house is built to the lead standard, uh, uh, sustainability. Um, if you see some of the spaces on the inside, you know, large glass walls that are open that he can get fresh air in. Uh, he's got uh, various different components that, that are more high tech than the standard Oakwood house. So this is something that I think we're going to see throughout our community because we have most of our houses date from around, you know, 1920, 1930. Um, a lot of those houses, and I'm sure all of you who live in one, you know, they've got their own sets of problems. Uh, and they'll probably last us another 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But at some point, we are going to start looking at houses needing to come down and what do we infill them back with? I think there's always going to be that uh, desire to do the traditional style, but I think that we will also start seeing a lot more of these newer type things that 
serve the needs specifically of, of the family, you know, larger family rooms, um, you know, maybe not as much um, uh, glass on the front and more on the back, outdoor living, those type of things. So I think it's going to be something that uh, we're going to see some, some new styles of architecture. And that, I think, is one of the great things uh, about our community. I'll tell you that I used to live uh, on Triangle Avenue. Uh, when I first joined the Oakwood Historical Society, I found a, um, an ad that was put up by the developer who actually built my house in 24, I think it was. Um, and the picture is fantastic because it shows my house and there was nothing next to it. There, you could sort of see in the background, there was a house maybe you know, two blocks over. Uh, there were like little stick trees out in the front. You know, it was, it was the prototypical brand new development. Um, a lot of people saw that. I'm sure at that time, you know, the, the Pattersons, the people who have the big estates going, oh, what are they doing over there? Why are they building these little things over here? But now those have become the character of Oakwood. So we always have to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, time changes, the, the importance of various different things change, and we could see some architectural styles that we might not agree with now, but, you know, they're the ones that are going to carry us into the future. Um, Going along with that um, is, you know, we're going to look at issues of state sustainability. I think one of the things that I mentioned before in the the, uh, the book that I was talking about, the X factors, is you know our ability uh, to uh, heat and cool our homes, uh, to provide um, energy for our different homes. Uh, I think we're going to start seeing a lot more solar panels. We're going to see a lot more um, maybe wind turbines, various different things like that. So. It's something that I think we're going to have to start getting used to. Um, I think as a city, we're going to work on developing comprehensive um, uh, policies as to how those are actually implemented so that we don't just have people doing things uh, without any thought as to how it, it looks or how it functions well. Um, but I think this is something that we're going to look at in the future. I know that if you walk around now, you'll, you'd be surprised at how many people have uh, solar on their house, uh, looking at you two down front. Um, but it's just a fantastic opportunity for us to, to really, um, uh, try to make sure that our community is more sustainable in the future. And along with sustainability is, is recycling. I think that as a community, we've done a great job. Uh, if you look at our recycling rates versus some of the ones around us, it's, you know, nor what are we at, like almost 50%? Correct. Almost 50% of the uh, trash that leaves our households is recyclable uh, and is, is recycled. Uh, you look at other communities, and here's my pot shots, you know, they don't take it as serious, you know, and the, their numbers are more like, you know, 10%, 20%, those type of things. So the, the residents of Oakland have really sort of uh, found that this is an important thing for them, trying to recycle as much as possible. When we first got into the recycling biz, it was a little bit more uh, uh, economically uh, profitable for us. You know, we were getting a lot more money for cardboard and, and recyclables. Um, that has gone away, but it's still something we feel is important. And in the end, it's better that we do the, the right thing and send less of our stuff to landfills uh, because eventually those landfills are going to be filled up and we're going to have to go to someplace else and fill that landfill up. And, you know, the, the future is something we have to look at our sustainability um, options. Uh, technology. <laughs> technology, and we just had uh, some issues with it this morning, but, um, or this afternoon. Technology is going to be one of those, those wild cards. We're not going to know exactly how that's going to affect the future of Oakwood. Um, I think right now we're looking at things like the uh, uh, fiber optics and uh, how we get information to everybody's households now. Uh, we've got um, the glass fiber lines, those type of things. Uh, but technology could be anything from you know the new signalization that are our, our traffic signals. Um, all of these things are sort of the, the harder ones to, to figure out. Uh, it's things that are on city council's radar, on my radar as just somebody who's interested in, in how our, our society is developing, um, but it's sort of the, the great unknown. Uh, and, but the important thing is that we have a comprehensive plan in place 
that when new things come up, that we use those to try to figure out how we can uh, uh, provide the best services to our, to our citizens. Water management. Um, this one is, is one that I will say actually scares me a little bit. Um, water management in, in the city of Oakwood, we are very fortunate. We have our own wells, um, we have our own water system, um, but that water system is based on a, an aquifer that's below us. Uh, and we're pulling water from that aquifer and we're providing our citizens with that. Now that aquifer doesn't have hard lines at the ends of our city. Uh, the, you know, things that are taking place in the city of Dayton and the city of Kettering, any place around us, uh, if we're not doing the right things that for water management and pollution is getting into that aquifer, that's going to affect how our water system is. So water management is one that we're constantly um, aware of. We're trying to stay uh, engaged with like the Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission that I mentioned before, seeing what types of projects are being done in other communities and making sure that those don't uh, put, uh, pose any potential harm to the aquifer. Um, we've only got one water system, you know, almost all the water that we get comes from that aquifer. Uh, so we have to make sure that, uh, that we maintain that as well as we can. Energy, as I mentioned sort of before with sustainability, you know, we're looking at, you know, how that's gonna be uh, managed in the future. Uh, you know, the solar panels, you know, are folks gonna have wind turbines on the front of their houses? Um, what kind of different things are gonna take place uh, in terms of energy? Um, it's one of those that, you know, every time you, you read a different uh, scientific magazine, they say, well, you know, we're moving this side or this direction, you know, with atomics or whatever. Um, it's just one we're gonna have to stay on top of. Um, I've always said that, you know, if I had my druthers and we could do anything, it would be to put all the, our, our electrical lines underground in Oakwood. Uh, if you've seen the, uh, uh, the Point Oakwood development, if you drive around the Point Oakwood development, one of the things you'll notice is there are no power lines. They put everything underground and that's the smart way of doing things, you know, but they had the luxury of doing it in the present and not in the past when before it was a lot easier to just throw a few poles and we ran the lines across there. Uh, as a community that has as many trees as we do, I think everybody's experienced that windstorm that suddenly gives you about six hours of spending some time with some candlelight. Um, so uh, that's something that we're gonna always be cognizant of uh, is energy distribution throughout our, our community. And when the opportunities arise for us to do things where it might be underground, uh, we're gonna look at those. But I'll tell you, it's very, very expensive. So um, it's just one of the things we have to, to be cognizant of. Economic system, systems, as I mentioned, I'm starting to get into the ones that we actually have no control over, but we have to be cognizant of how that affects us. Um, as you can tell, you know, a lot of times we are um, uh, we are at the mercy of how our economic system is working out. When the Point Oakwood uh, project was first proposed, was right before the crash of 2008. You know, so there were all these glorious plans about all the things that we were going to do, and then 2008 hit, and then I think we saw a project that we thought was going to be built out within two or three years turn into you know, almost a 10 year kind of thing. And that had to do a lot with the economic system uh, in our country. Um, the other thing that economic systems specifically rate to, um, and this once again, I, I go back to, this is my opinion, not city council's opinion, but you know, if you look at uh, things like crime in our area, you know, in, in the region, I think that, you know, uh, a lot of crime is developed by people not having the economic um, uh, opportunities that other people have. Uh, and that tends to drive some of the, the, uh, the crime in our region. So making sure that everybody has an, a, a, an ability to, um, to make a good living, I think helps reduce some of the, the crime factors in, in our communities. But uh, this is one that we just have to be cognizant of and keep an eye on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this, this one is, this one is big. Um, 
as a community, and I think we've all experienced this, you know, an event will take place in our community and suddenly it is on social media, it is on whichever group, and I'm not going to pick on any groups out there, but um, suddenly this happened and it turns into this and it turns into that. And before you know it, people are starting to spout uh, things that they they don't know for a fact, they just think they've heard it somewhere. So this is gonna be an, an issue I think we're gonna be fighting for you know, probably the rest of our lives. Um, it's something that as a city, we, we take really um, seriously, you know, how many people have heard the, you know, the, the dome, you know, we live under the dome, you know, uh, there were elitists that were whatever the case might be. This is all just disinformation. Somebody who has a grudge against something, something bad happened to them, and rather than try to deal with whatever the specifics were, it's easier just to make generalizations and throw those out there. So as a community, I think we're constantly going to be figuring out how do we get the message out. It, this one is, is near and dear to my heart because when I first ran for city council in 2007, one of the, you know, uh, one of the issues that I felt was really important was to, to make sure that the city really communicated with its citizens as, as well as it could in terms of just openness and transparency and, you know, getting that information out. Now, all these years later, I realize how difficult that is sometimes because you kind of think, well, you've got the bully pulpit and everybody's listening to what you have to say, but you're also competing against 9,000 other people who are all yelling at the top of their lungs to whatever viewpoints they might have. So we are constantly trying to find new ways to get that information out to our citizens, whether that's um, our, uh, uh, our annual report, which I brought a ton of uh, in the back of the room, if you'd like to read those. This is a, a very, very comprehensive document. Uh, it, you should all get it uh, delivered to your house every year, um, but it is a very comprehensive document that talks about almost all the different things that I've talked about already here. You know, uh, uh, public safety or housing, zoning codes, all of those different things. We find it very important to get this message out as much as possible. because We, people, we want people to have the facts. Uh, and we also want folks to feel like they can come to us and ask us the questions. Uh, and not necessarily get it from other sources. So, uh, civility and extremism. Um, this is also going to be one that I think we're going to be dealing with for a long time. Um, one of the things that we are very fortunate in the city of Oakwood uh, is that we have a very educated um, uh, population. We have a lot of folks who have, you know, higher degrees, uh, you know, higher level of education. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily always equate to <laughs> civility uh, and a, a lack of, of, of extremism. Um, so it's, it's going to be a constant battle to make sure that we understand that um, Oakwood has sort of that vision statement where we want to make sure that everybody feels like their viewpoints are being heard, um, that we're inclusive in the way things are being done. Um, that's the only way you can fight some of the extremism that's going on in the country today is just to, to sit and listen to what everybody has to say. Um, now, I'll tell you that as a city council person, if I had a dollar for every time somebody said, you didn't listen to what I had to say, you know, you, you made a decision and you weren't listening to what I had to say. Uh, well, we listen to what people have to say. We just don't always have the same opinion on what the, the final outcome is going to be. Um, so we try to make sure that when we uh, evaluate various different issues that we're open with the public, we, we hear what they have to say, uh, but at the end of the day, the group gets together and makes a decision based on what they think is, is the best way of doing things. So we're listening all the time. Trust me, we, we get uh, emails, we get phone calls, we get all these different uh, uh, people reacting to things. Um, so we want to continue to do that so that we try to maybe take a little bit of that extremism out of, uh, uh, of the mix. Um, and then the last one that I'll talk about is reality versus virtual reality. And I bring this one up. It, it sounds like it's sci-fi and it's, it's far-fetched or whatever, but how many people have been sitting, you know, either with your spouse or with your family members and everybody's looking at their phone and, and nobody's talking to each other in the room. Uh, I found myself doing that. My wife and I are sitting in the exact same room. We've both 
been looking at the phone for 45 minutes. Um, I think that one of the things we're going to have to worry about in the future is not necessarily just the full on virtual reality, although I think, you know, if Mark Zuckerberg has his way, he, he might <coughs> have us all in the metaverse soon. But I think that we're always going to have this um, uh, issue with convincing people that the services and the various different um, amenities that we have in the city of Oakwood are worth the money that are being spent if those people feel like really all they have to do is look at their phone constantly. You know, if they put on these little goggles and suddenly you can be in Greece and you can be snow skiing in the Alps or whatever the case might be, it sounds far-fetched, but I think there is going to start to get a time when people spend more time inside their house interacting with electronics than interacting with their own community, going to the park, going, you know, talking to their neighbors by walking up and down the street. I think that there's going to get this time period when we're going to have to worry about these kind of issues. And, you know, it might not be the next generation, but maybe it's the generation after that who start saying, well, you know, I'm just more interested in how I can connect with the metaverse and how do I have internet access this way and that way. I'm not all that concerned about a new uh, uh, field house for athletics and playing basketball because I can play basketball on, on you know, on this, this metaverse. Um, so that's one of those one that's, I, like I said, I think it's far-fetched this time, but it's something that uh, you know, personally, I think, you know, you look at the trends and you figure out where are things are going. Uh, and this is a trend that, that scares me in, in uh, a little bit. Um, but overall, I just wanna, I wanna say that I, I believe Oakwood's future is extremely bright. Uh, and for the exact reason I mentioned earlier is that we have a very educated, engaged uh, constituency. We have residents who really care about our community. Um, one of the things that I think we're very fortunate of um, although somebody, some people will, will disagree, is we are a 98% residential community. That means that everybody has a vested interest in what's going on in our community. Other communities where they might be say 64 or 60% uh, residential and 40% commercial. Well, when you've got that many uh, large industries and commercial uh, groups, they're making some of the decisions or they're influencing some of the decisions as well. And they're not doing it for, you know, the, the betterment of the community. They're doing it for their own betterment. Uh, so I think we're very fortunate in that the major push in terms of um, making our community better is, is personal to all of us. Uh, it's something that we feel is important. We want to get involved. We want to be engaged. We want our uh, viewpoints heard. Um, and I think that that's something that really lends itself to our community uh, uh, succeeding in the future. So, like I said, I think our future is extremely bright uh, coming going forward. Uh, started with Abraham Lincoln. I'll sort of finish with him as well. Uh, best thing about the future is that it comes to us one day at a time. So, you know, all the things that we talked about in terms of you know water management or transportation or infrastructure are not things that are just going to sneak up on us. They're going to be something that we're going to every day we're going to know we have these things to deal with. And you know, we wanna make sure that we're dealing with them in a quick, um, uh, efficient way, uh, and we don't let them sneak up on us. Um, here's gonna be my pot shot at, at some of the surrounding communities, um, but it's more of a brag on, on our part. Um, Oakwood is a community that does not defer maintenance. Um, how many people had sidewalks in front of their house redone like in the last couple of years? <laughs> okay. I know how annoying that can be at times, but. If you walk down any sidewalk in the city of Oakwood, very rarely will you find a cracked panel or a panel that's heaving or whatever else. You go to other communities, because they have so many other issues and so many limited resources uh, or things to spend their resources on, they defer maintenance. They push that off a few years. And the problem is when you start pushing things off a few years, you never get caught up. You just never do because there will always be that new project that has to you know, uh, be dealt with. And they just never get around to the things that I think are extremely important to our community. Walkability, you know, I love the fact that I can walk around and not have to worry about 
you know, heaving sidewalks and, and cracked areas and depressions and those type of things. Um, that's a conscious decision that the, the, the city of Oakland has made, you know, as a community that we say that's an important thing that we, we feel we want to make sure that our, our, our streets are well maintained, sidewalks are well maintained, landscaping, our parks, all these different things. They take money, they take time, we have to stay on top of these things, but they show our uh, level of commitment to our community. Um, so it's going to be one day at a time. Everything will come to us and we will deal with them that way. Uh, but the last one I'll end up with is Mahatma Gandhi. He said, the future depends on what we do in the present. So that comprehensive plan that we use now is something we have to constantly be aware of. We have to uh, sort of vet it constantly with the issues that come before us, as well as making sure that our citizens are um, reading through it and making sure that it's still valid. Uh, we did, as I mentioned before, uh, a large study of you know, what kind of things from the 2004 plan to now, what things we had actually checked off of our list and which things we're still working on. Uh, I think we've made great progress towards a lot of them. We still got some work to do on, on some of the other ones, but it's going to be something that we're constantly going to be doing today, knowing that it's going to pay the benefits in the future. Um, so with that, I will thank you for your attention and I will open it up to any questions you might have. Did I talk? Ooh. Wow, right at an hour. Sorry about that. I I've thought got, I, I thought I had like 45 I've got one minutes. from the left. Okay, yes, go ahead. I'm gonna try to turn the news on or news off. <coughs> Janine, go ahead and unmute yourself if you've got a question. She's got a hand up. <laughs> and it's been up for about 10 minutes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> She's not unmuting. Okay, anybody else? In, yeah. Uh, I want you to predict the future. Okay. <laughs> Put my Swami hat on. Okay, as of January 1, the city's going to start charging people to pick up debris that's in the street that is not leaves. If I interpret that correctly? No, that is not correct. Uh, they're, they're going to be charged to have it. If they don't do it correctly. Yes. Yes. No, what currently the way we have yard debris pickup is that you are supposed to put the debris out on your property, not in the street. Right. So if people put if their yard street they will be charged yes. yes so what's your prediction oh what's my prediction oh we're going to make a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> we're going to make a lot of money um, no, what i think is going to happen and is, i think that's sad because what? you've been saying for years i mean ever since we we've lived here for almost 50 years and the the newsletter is constantly saying do not put anything etc 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 yet it, and I will tell you that that's. Really think this is going to solve the, what you. Well, I think when problem. you get that first one hundred and fifty dollar bill, yeah, I think it's it's going to make you think. Well, okay, maybe I do need to put it in in on my yard. In all seriousness, this is something that we've been dealing with for a long period of time, and people have done it, and we we tag them and and we give them little notices and tell them that they're supposed to do it this way, but we have repeat offenders like anything, you know, uh, there will be those people who just, I'm going to do it this way no matter what. Uh, and so what our, our crews have done is, you know, they have to go out there and, you know, they're picking up the yard debris and then suddenly, you know, they've got this pile that goes out into the street. They got to stop the vehicle. They've got to get out there. They've got to do the cleanup, you know, so it, it's not as efficient as we would like it to be. Uh, and like I said, we, we made the effort to reach out to these folks. So we're, now we're, you know, we're, we're going through the list of what our options are. We, we're trying to, you know, we sent out newsletters, we've done things in the Oakwood Register, but if people aren't listening to those things, at some point you just have to say, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to start implementing uh, fines. Uh, one of the things that I perceive is that we really don't know what the effect is of putting something out in the street that you don't want us to put out. In other words, when it starts to rain and I watch my neighbor's grass 
mm -hmm. look down the street into the gutter. Maybe there needs to be a little bit more scare tactic. It's my God, this is what happens when this stuff washes down the street. And, yeah, because you know, there's there's you know there's transportation gone, issues you know, too. You know, people have to swerve their vehicle. Yeah, the, or you want the, the article that will be in the speak loud because you're yeah the article that'll be in the Oakwood C newsletter that you'll get in a couple of weeks has exactly that in it. Yeah. So yeah, we want to we want to make sure that people realize we're not just trying to be um, just mean. We, we no, really petty. looked at we're, we're not trying to be petty, right? Exactly. There are serious transportation issues. We don't want people swerving to to avoid large uh, piles of debris uh, in in the streets. Um, it just makes it safer for our folks to do their job. It's more efficient for them to do their job. Uh, so we're just looking at one new thing. I'll I'll tell you. We had long conversations about this as to how, you know, how it was going to be perceived by the community, whether, you know, we we're going to be seen as being too authoritarian or whatever the case might be. But, you know, all the stories that I hear from our service workers, who, by the way, do a fantastic job, they, they work their butts off for us. They're just trying to, to be able to do their job at the right pace. And I think we've all had situations where sometimes, you know, uh, the pickup date was this date and it stays there for another day or two. The reason most likely that happened is because they got behind schedule because somebody did something that made them have to get out of the truck, do various different other things. So we're just trying to keep people on schedule uh, and provide the right services. Yeah. I got a couple from the well. Okay. First one, as long as you are working on Far Hills traffic signals, why not set them so you can ride a bike across without having to get off the street to push a button. Xenia has managed to do it. Underground pressure plates can detect the presence of a bicycle. I do not have an answer for that one, but we will, we will definitely look at that. Um, I will say before, you know, before we get out of here though, I've got a whole stack of business cards. I've got a, a whole stack of the uh, annual reports if people have ideas that we need to look at, I want you to know your city council people, we're your neighbors. You know, we're not somebody who lives in Washington, D.C. and comes over here, you know, once or twice. We're here facing the exact same issues that you are. And one of the things I think is great, but also a little sad is, you know, I don't get a lot of phone calls from the community. So I either think we're doing everything extremely, extremely well, uh, which I'm fingers crossed, or that people don't feel like they can reach out to us. But I will tell you that my personal phone number is on every single one of the business cards. Uh, every city council member's phone number is on the website. So if you want to call and talk to us, we're more than happy to do that. And I'll tell you that a lot of the greatest ideas that we've gotten at city council have been from folks who just said, Hey, I saw this done in some other community. Can we do it here? You know? And we're like, yeah, we just never thought of that. Um, so it's not that, you know, we're missing things, but you know, we focus on other things and, you know, so if they have a, an idea for how we can make it safer for our uh, bicyclists, I'm, I'm more than happy to hear that. Okay. Second question. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Sorry, I can't be there in person, but can you address how the city's demographics will change in the future? As our country and region becomes more diverse, I shouldn't have touched something. <laughs> as our, our country and region becomes more diverse, no, I'm gonna just leave that one. That's okay. I apologize. No, you're fine. What will the city do to make Oakwood more inclusive and welcoming for the future residents of our beloved city? Okay. The way I'm going to answer this one is there is, there is a thought that the city of Oakwood is different from the community of Oakwood, that the government, that our city council is some sort of magic group that makes things happen. You know, uh, making things more open and inclusive and those type of things will be everybody's job. It will be, you know, neighbors talking to neighbors. It will be neighbors talking to people they work with, folks who are coming into our community uh, that you meet at church and they're just 
finding something out or if you like I do work out of the base and you have people who are moving there and like oh well should, where should I look in the city of you know in this area we have to do the things that are going to draw people as an entire community the city can do what we can to to uh, you know get the information out there to, for people to understand what their services are what our amenities are what are the things that you know as a community we have value you know, if somebody is moving to the area, I always tell them to go check out our website because you can read our comprehensive plan. You can see our vision statement. You can think, you can read all those things about what we do as a community. But at the end of the day, the city of Oakwood, you know, the administration, we are not going to be the ones who are going to be driving that, that mission. We'll help out any way we can, but really what it boils down to is, you know, our constituents, our, our residents just have to go out there and, and and sell the city of Oakwood. I think that, as I mentioned before, about disinformation and civility, I think people have a lot of preconceived notions about what Oakwood is, and they're not true. And I think anybody who comes here and talks to somebody and comes to the library and talks with folks here, they're going to find out that we're a very open, inclusive community, that we all just care about our, our neighbors, our property, you know, our, you know, making sure that our kids can go to school safely. So, the city will do all we can to help that, but we're really counting on our citizens to step up and make sure that they're, um, you know, reflecting what Oakwood really stands for. And Steve, to tag onto that, the Oakwood Inclusion uh, Coalition is yes. a 501c3 that is a very active group. Yes, Norm, you told me about them, but yeah. I think there's a link off the Oakwood page to get to them. I know they periodically meet. Yes. And there's they're a great forum to, to voice these kind of issues. Yeah, that, that's one of the things that we, as a city, we really try to stress is grassroots efforts. We'll, we'll, we're happy to put them together and to put people in contact with like-minded folks who have a, a mission, you know, whether it might be, you know, Green Oakwood who have sustainability, uh, sustainability issues that they want to promote, whether it's the Oakwood Inclusion Committee, whether it's the Moms Group, whatever those things might be. We're here to help those groups. But we really see that they are the ones who are going to be leading the charge. Uh, and, you know, because they're the ones who are directly passionate about that. We're, you know, I'm passionate about bringing as many folks here as we possibly could get. You know, I love the diversity. I think the diversity is getting more and more so uh, than when I first moved here in 99. It's not going to be an overnight process. But I, I see that, you know, when I talk to folks at these type of things, Everybody's just so open and welcoming that I can't imagine that people see it differently, but I know that they do because of disinformation and, you know, the, the various different uh, stereotypes that Oakwood has. Some of those are, uh, are rooted in history, but they are history, and we're trying to, to move beyond those things. So, yes, sir. Uh, how would you describe our relationship with the University of Dayton? And do they have anything? Man, I was so hoping I would not get this question. <laughs> uh, um, I, I think that oh, we have a, a fairly good relationship with the city of, or uh, the uh, University of Dayton. Uh, as, as a border uh, to us, we're constantly working with them to make sure that some of the issues that uh, are happening over there don't creep into our community. When I was putting together this presentation, I, I will, I'm not exaggerating when I say I probably had like 50 pages of notes of various different things to talk about. You know, one of them was, okay, well, we've got these, these border situations where we've got the University of Dayton, we've got our, our connection with the city of Kettering. Each one of those has its own sets of problems. The University of Dayton one tends to be a little bit more of a problem, um, but, you know, for, for reasons of, you know, uh, housing stock, you know, folks wanting to buy those properties and turning them into uh, rentals. And we've done things with our, our policies of, of making sure that only two non-related folks can live in a, in a property at one time. We just don't want all of them to turn into student rentals. Um, but it's, it's going to be one of those things where, as I mentioned before, it's just going to be a matter of talking with them and keeping a, a regular dialogue with them as much as possible. Um, and it's something that we have done in the past. We've kind of fallen off a little bit in, in the recent 
um, present. Uh, some of it has to do with COVID. Some of it has to do with some other issues. But uh, I think we have a good relationship with them and will continue because they're not going away anytime soon and neither are we. So <coughs> any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I noticed that especially with the housing prices kind of inflating over the last couple of years, a lot of houses are being purchased not by individuals or families, but by corporations and other companies and either turning them into rentals or even worse, turning them into kind of permanent Airbnbs. Is that something that's regulated in any way or, or a concern of, of Oakwood here? Yeah, uh, the Airbnb thing, we sort of took care of that uh, a couple okay. of years ago okay. in, in that uh, that's really not something that we're encouraging folks policy-wise to do okay. um, because we did have some issues, you know, I'm not going to take pot shots at Airbnb folks who, you know, if you do that, that that's fantastic. We didn't see it was as something we needed in our community um, because we we saw, you know, unfortunately, some of the things that go along with those is that, you know, people come in for a UD game and, you know, they want to relive, relive their college years, you know, and they live right next to a house that has three small children. You know, and so that's that's not a really uh, compatible situation. So we almost see it as a, a zoning type thing of saying that's really just not what we're trying to do as a community. Uh, and fortunately for us, we're not in a situation where I think we have to do that kind of thing. I think people's property values are are uh, uh, stable and and very healthy enough now that people don't have to sort of rely on you know hopefully renting out their houses on the weekends kind of thing. So uh, it's something we're, we're always cognizant of because at the end of the day, and I tell this to everybody, city council works for you. And we've had developers come in and say, I wanna do this, I wanna do this. I'm like, I don't work for you. You know, If you're from outside of our community, uh, I'll take what you're uh, talking about and what you wanna do for our community seriously. But at the end of the day, it's gonna be what the, the community as a whole wants to do. So. One more from the yep. web. Okay. What is planned for the under construction building in the shops of Oakwood? Oh, um, I think they mean the old Sherman's Barbershop um, building. Okay. Um, it could be the one in Kettering. Yes. You know. that, that one, okay. Yes. Uh, that one has uh, been purchased by a, a developer out of California, I think it is. Uh, and they are spending a lot of money redoing the facade and making it, uh, you know, bringing it up because it, quite frankly, it sort of looked like, you know, a 60s modern building. And I think now it'll look like a 22 modern building. Um, uh, but it's, it's going to be one of those things where I think they're spending some money there. I do not know who the tenants are, and, and I don't think we've gotten any information about potential tenants there yet. Uh, another just quick area that I'll mention is I think everybody has some uh, concern or some interest in the uh, old 2600 building um, that has been purchased by Kettering Health. Uh, they're looking at doing something there, but we're still working with them in terms of what they actually can do uh, because of the size of the building, because of the uh, use that they're proposing for it. There are certain parking issues that are going to go along with that. Uh, we want to make sure that the residents in that area don't get feel like they're being inundated with, you know, people who are there just to go do whatever they need to do. Um, that that area has always sort of been sensitive because you know, you've got Dorothy Lane there, you've got um, uh, Arrow Wine, you've got a lot of shops there, and I think some of the residents who live on either side, and I used to be one of those residents, um, sometimes feel like, okay, a lot of that parking is creeping into our neighborhood. So we're, we're making sure that Kettering Health is doing all the right things that they need to to provide the proper parking. Uh, but that's something that's gonna be maybe a year in the future, something like that, so, yeah. Maybe a crazy idea, but if we ever look at trying to the annex scenarios adjacent to Oakley. Oh yeah, I always talk with Kettering. I, I wanna invade them all the time. <laughs> 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 the old mayor, the, Don Patterson, I was like, oh, yeah, we're, we're going to annex you, whether you like it or not. Um, but, yeah. Um, no, we really haven't looked at any of those things. <laughs> the closest thing we've done to that is, you know, with the old river fields in that area. Um, we've tried to take that, that. We own that land, but it's in the city of Dayton. Um, and we've tried to, 
you know, sort of creep our border to the outside of that. They're not interested in, in uh, letting us annex that. Uh, but really, there's no other, I think, areas. Our, our borders are fairly well established at this point, and I don't see us uh, doing any annexation in the future. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Stephen, all of you, I thank you for your time. Sure. Um, I think the, not only the presentation, but the questions and the dialogue give us all a feeling of comfort that Oakwood now and Oakwood in the future is going to be a very successful, wonderful place to live. And that we as citizens need to stay engaged and involved to keep our community healthy and viable. So thank you so much. Quickly before you leave, um, preview of things to come. Spring of 2023, we're gonna look forward and skip over all the cold winter. Um, in February, we're going to have Martin Gottlieb, who was on the staff of the Dayton newspapers come. Um, in doing some of his political writing, he came across a Congressman Clement Valentham. Apparently in the Washington DC area and literature, this was a very prominent Congressman. But yet most of us sit here kind of with a quizzical look on our face going, who the heck is he? And he's going to come and share with us the story of this very fascinating man from Dayton. Um, that's going to be on February the 19th. Then March the 19th, we have Mark in the back who's going to be talking about the classic architecture of Oakwood, going through all of the houses and talking about what happened in terms of architecture. I think that's fascinating to hear. And finally, we have a really interesting topic in April. Um, you've all heard Steve talk about sustainability. We know that the Wright Library has a program on native plants. And um, we're going to have the Garden Club of Dayton come to talk about some of the very beautiful, well-designed gardens <coughs> of the, 19, the early 1900s here in Oakwood. They're going to walk us through how gardens have morphed into the 40s and 50s and the landscaping to getting us to the point of the native plant gardens that we're seeing now start to surface. So um, we're going to tie it in with the library and maybe some of the other groups in the area. So I think it's going to be a really interesting topic and it's timed perfectly for the spring. when We're all tired of snow and dead looking things and we want to get in our garden to do things. So I invite you to attend those. So as we look forward to next year, I also want to thank you so much for being here. Wish you all happy Thanksgiving and very happy holidays and a very healthy 2023. Thank you so much for supporting us this year. Thank <laughs> you.